So as you open a Bible to Luke 24, we look at the story of Easter Sunday of the resurrection. I want to ask a couple questions of you. How many of you have ever received a gift that you didn't actually want? Anybody? And then did, did, did you do the whole faking gratitude in front of your friend or family member? Like, oh, wow, this is so great. That's when you know your friends don't want what you give them is when they pretend like that, right? Anybody ever given a gift to somebody and you could kind of tell they didn't like it or want it? Anybody have to do that? You're like, well, we'll try again next year, right? What what I have learned is that it is incredibly hard to receive or to give a gift to somebody or from someone when it is something that you don't think you want or need. Right? It, we, we love to receive gifts. Some of us, we love to give things to others out of love. But when they already have it or they already think they have something better, it is, they're going to have the reaction of, gee, thanks. Right? And if you've been on the receiving end and someone, maybe you weren't even asking for anything. They just love you so much. They just surprised you with a gift and you're like, Well, I'll just say thank you because that's the polite thing to do. But in your heart, you know, yeah, I don't really need this or want this. But it doesn't stop their excitement, right? Because they're still like, open it. Don't you love it, right? And when we do this on a human level, we, we also do this on a spiritual level. When it comes to Jesus, he wants to give you something. Right? He, he loves you so much that without you asking, he has given you his death, his life, and his resurrection. The problem is not with the gift, but with us. Because we don't think that we actually need it. Because how many of you are alive right now? Just a couple. Okay. <laughs> We'll check on the rest of you after service, right? But if someone was to ask you, like, are you alive? You would say, yeah, I'm alive. No, but I'm going to give you life. I already have it. What, What do you mean you're going to give it to me? And so when it comes to Easter, when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to Christianity, we we mix it up all the time. And instead of joyfully receiving the gift that Jesus actually wants to give to you, which is life, because we think to ourselves, I already have it. I already have a life. I'm already living it. I don't don't need a new one. I don't need what you're giving me. But I will go to church on Easter. I will go to church every once in a while when my family bugs me to keep them off my back. I will go and do these things because then I can ask God, for the things I need, or the things that I think I need, or the things that I want, right? So I'll I'll do a few good things. I'll, you know, okay, I'll give prayer a try. So God, could you please give me a new car? Could you please make my living situation better? Could you please give me better employment? Could you give me a new job? Could you give me a better relationship? Could you give me a new relationship? Could you give me better friends? Whatever it might be. So we come to God all the time wanting gifts. God, would you please just do this for me? But what we do is we limit it and we tell God, I know what I need, not you. I know better. And I don't need what you're offering. So let me just give you the list. And here's the real problem with that, is that it actually destroys the whole point of following Jesus. It destroys the the whole point of Christianity and believing in Jesus. But it's hard for us to understand, right? Because we're living. I have a life, you have a life, we're breathing. So it's like, what do I need that for? And the reality is that the disciples on the very first Easter We're struggling with the same thing. They followed and loved Jesus for over three years. 
They, they obeyed his teaching. They were trying to live it out. They were trying to be a good person and they were trying to do the things that Jesus said, like love people, serve people, help the poor, care for those in need, look out for those who are being mistreated. All the things that even if you don't believe in Jesus right now would go, yeah, those are good things. I'm gonna do some of those in my life. So the, the disciples were doing all of these things. And then they watched Jesus get nailed to a cross. And they watch Jesus die. And we have the tradition as Christians going, oh, well, yeah, but Easter's coming. And so we'll say Christ is risen. And everybody responds. He's risen. Right. We know that because we're like, yeah, that's the whole point. But they didn't know that. If you go back to, to the moment that they're living in, it's just another disappointment. Avoiding Luke 24, on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? This is one of my favorite questions of all time. But it, in the moment, it's actually kind of an unfair question because if you're the women, what's going to be your answer? Not looking for the living, right? They didn't show up to the tomb going, we're going to find Jesus walking around. They showed up expecting what? To find the dead among the dead. Right? They, they were showing up with the intention and the sole purpose of grieving and paying their last respects to Jesus and saying goodbye. And then walking away disappointed. Well, we tried following him. We tried it his way. We tried following his teachings. I guess we'll just got to find something else. And they get asked this question, why, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Right? And it's the same question that you and I have to answer for ourselves personally. Where am I looking for the living? Where am I looking for life? And we do it in all kinds of places, in all kinds of locations. We, we will try religion. Right? You will try like the disciples did and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a couple of these good things. I'm going to follow these things, and I'm going to see if it works out and makes my life better. And then, if it doesn't, what do you do? You walk away disappointed and go, well, I guess I'll try something else. And then some of you have even probably tried Jesus. You said, well, I tried that. But then like the women, you're like, yeah, but, it, you know. It didn't work out. He died. Like, so, you know, Pastor, I, I tried praying about that thing. I asked God for that. I asked for this, or I tried the way, you know, to raise my kids according to the Bible. I tried these things to make my marriage better, and then things still didn't work out the way I hoped. So what do we do? We, we end up like the first disciples, feeling a little disappointed. And the reason is, is because we're answering the question the wrong way, right? We're answering the question of why, you, why are you looking for life here? Why are you looking for the living among the dead in the wrong way? We're trying to answer it of, well, if I just behave the right way, if I just follow certain rules, if I just do these things this way, then, and how many of you have filled in that blank? My marriage will get better will stop fighting. My kids will listen to me. They will return my phone calls. Right? They'll love each other. If I do these things, then I'll get rewarded at work because they'll recognize, wow, this is a good person and doing all kinds of good things. And if I follow all these rules, oh, then, then I will get all kinds of recognition. And all these people will love me and say, wow, what a good person. And a lot of us and a lot of people have been sold that that's what following Jesus is all about. 
A lot of us have been sold this lie that that's what Christianity is all about. If you, if you do the work and if you do these good things, if you do that thing, and if you don't do these things over here, there's you know, usually a huge list, then all the things that you hope for, that you're asking God for, he'll give you. You'll have the life that you wanted. One of my best friends in the whole world, when he first came to our church in Houston, which was in our living room, so it wasn't really fancy, he, he told me, he's like, well, I just believe that if you just do it God's way, everything will work out. Anybody ever been told or thought that mentality? Quite a lot of people have been told that or given that impression of that's what Christianity is all about. That God just says, I want you to follow these rules and here's the do's and here's the don'ts and if, and if you obey me, then I will love you and I will make things work out for you and I'll give you the life that you want. The problem is, how many of you have ever come to the realization it, it doesn't actually work that way? Anybody ever done, I'm not even talking about God's rules, just in your own mind, you said you did the right thing and things still went badly for you. Anybody? Right? Like, no, I'm going to do the right thing and I'll get rewarded. And then you got punished or you got blamed for it or they didn't want to listen or they didn't want to apologize or any of those kinds of things, right? We, we know that this way of thinking doesn't actually lead to the life we want and desire and need. And the good news of Christianity is that God did not send Jesus to tell you all the things you can and cannot do. He didn't send Jesus so that you would have to create the life you need yourself and do it through your own effort, your own goodness, your own morals. Instead, he sent Jesus to actually give you life. So to take all that burden of having to do it yourself off of your heart and soul. To take all the burden of all of your failures. And for some of us, we feel like those failures keep adding up every day. He says, no, I'm gonna take those from you and I'm just here to give you life. See, our problem is that sometimes we don't think we actually need what Jesus is offering. And so we go running around, whether it's on Easter morning or any other day, searching desperately to find that satisfying fullness of life. Right, and y'all know what I'm talking about, which is the life I'm talking about is you look at your life and anybody ever had a moment or a season in your life where you go, this is not the way I planned things, right? This is not the way I thought or hoped it would go. And so what we do is we, we are desperately running around trying different things. It's, I'm gonna try and be the best person I possibly can. I'm gonna, I'm gonna set my own moral standard. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be an ethical person. I'm gonna be a good person. I'm gonna do all the rules that Jesus said to do and then God will owe me. Or sometimes you go in the opposite direction. You say, well, it doesn't really matter, so I'm just going to do whatever pleasures me and makes me feel good in the moment. And the reality is both of those avenues lead to us being disappointed. And here's how I know, whether it's a, a bad thing, a struggle, an addiction, a pleasure thing, or it's I'm going to be the most well-behaved human being ever, is... You and I both know in our heart of hearts it doesn't work. And here's the evidence. Your own life is your evidence against you. Because how many of you have, okay, that didn't work out, and then you just came up with what you called a better plan? Well, that was my strategy before, and it didn't really work. But I know if I tweak it a little bit this time, right? Anybody ever done that? Like, yeah, if I just adjust it, okay, and man, I just got to put a little more discipline into it. It'll work out. Let me know when you're on your 50,000th plan and how it's going. And then if you go the other direction, you say, no, I'm just going to live for pleasure. That'll fulfill me. Whatever in the moment feels better. 
I've done a lot of counseling in my time as a pastor, and it usually is filled with regrets. Well, or I got bored with it, or I got bored with them. So I moved on to the next thing. And this time, oh no, it's gonna totally fulfill me, and it's gonna make me the happiest I've ever been until you get bored with it, because it didn't fulfill you. Here's the realization we all have to come to is that we actually do need new life. That that the way we are going about things on our own effort, whether it's super duper great behavior or I'm just going to do whatever feels great in the moment, both of them end up leaving us disappointed and longing in our hearts going, "I, I need something else. And see, it's the same thing for these women who loved Jesus and showed up to the tomb on that first Easter morning. They they were looking for life. They're like, no, we're going to find it, and it's going to be in how well we follow Jesus and how well we love him. And And it all came crashing down until they were asked the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? And the angels went on and said in verse 6, he is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you. Right? Like, Don't you remember what he said? How he told you everything that has happened in these last three days is exactly what he said was going to happen. That he was going to be handed over and delivered in the hands of sinful men, be crucified on the third day and rise. And they remembered his words. Now this idea of remembering his words doesn't mean that they forgot that Jesus had ever said them. What it meant is that they were finally beginning to understand what they actually meant. Because if you read the Gospels, every time Jesus says, by the way, I'm going to die and then rise again, every single one of his disciples goes, we don't get it. Or they just ignore it and move on to the next thing. So when it says that, oh, they remembered his words, they finally are figuring out and understanding who Jesus is. That Jesus is the living one. That he's he's not just here to give you a set of rules. He's not just here to give you a wonderful example of how to be a good person. He's not just here to give you a list of demands that says, do these things and then I will love you. No, he is the living one who has come to give you what you actually need, which is life. And this is who Jesus has always been. This is the whole reason he came, and actually in John chapter 10, he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Some translations say, have it to the full, and what it really means is that you would have life that overflows, that it it just never ends, it keeps going, that you are so captivated by Jesus, that you are so alive in him, that it overflows into all of your relationships and all the things that you do and desire. See, some of us walk away from Jesus or struggle with Jesus. We just do the church thing every once in a while because we've been sold a lie. And we've been looking for life amongst the dead. We think, no, Jesus, just, I got to follow these words. I got to do these right things. And there's a whole thing over here that I don't have to do. And if you just let Jesus speak for himself, here's what he came to do for you. He came to give you life that overflows. Another way to put it, He came to give you life that doesn't let you down, that doesn't disappoint you, that that doesn't lead to you getting bored and saying, I got to try something else. See, this is who Jesus is in the Bible. Here is the Jesus that absolutely does love you with a perfect love, is that he came with a singular purpose, and that was to give you the life you are desperately seeking and are desperately in need of. And this is who God has always been. I love that. He said, he's the living. They're like, no, he died. We saw him die. We we were here when he was buried. He says, no, but he's the living. Because Jesus has always been the living God. God has always been a God of life. He's always been the God of the living. In fact, Jesus in the Gospels even describes God that way. He says, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. In Genesis chapter 2, when God creates everything, this wonderful, beautiful creation that we enjoy with the flowers today that give glory and praises to God, this wonderful creation that he has placed you and I in, he gets to the point where he creates humanity. 
And he creates humanity in a unique way, unlike any other creature or any other part of creation. And in Genesis 2, it says, The Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. See, from the very beginning, our God is a God of life who gives life to you and me. And the important part is that this is the part of the story that happens before it all goes wrong, before we sin, before evil enters the world, before there's wickedness and brokenness and illness and death. See, sometimes people struggle with Jesus, because you go, oh, well, if he's so good, why is there bad in the world? Right? Some people go, well, I tried the Jesus thing. I was looking. I tried the religion, and it didn't work out, and now I'm going to go look for something else. Why doesn't God do something about it? And, And dear friends, first of all, God never intended it for it to be that way. His whole plan and his whole creation is, I give life, right? You and I are created to be living beings, living creatures. And so God comes up with a solution to the problem of evil and sickness and death, and that's to send the living one to come out of a tomb and rise again. And it sounds ridiculous, right? Even later on, they go and tell the disciples, not just any disciples, the apostles, the guys that Jesus handpicked. And they're like, hey, just so you know, we talked to some angels. Jesus isn't there. He's alive. We just thought you should know. And what is the response of the apostles? But these words seem to them an idle tale. Another way of saying it, useless words. Just a nice, you know, fairy tale. You, you just want it to be that way. And they did not believe them. Now, before those of you who are Christians and have been Christian for a long time judge the Peter and the apostles, like, how could they not get it? Just think for a moment, though, of, yeah, it, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds impossible. No, like, I've been to cemeteries before. Right? If you're the apostles, you're like, no, we, we've been to the graves of our loved ones before, and they were still there. This doesn't happen. But see, this isn't unusual for God, who is the God of the living. When we think about people dying, we talk about them being in the ground, right? And sometimes we say, oh, We're made out of dust. We're going to return to dust. We're in the earth. We're in the dirt. And at the beginning of creation, God looks at dirt, and he breathes life into it and creates humanity and says, here's a living creature. And in order to restore that life that you and I need, to give us a life that overflows, that is abundant and never ends and never disappoints, God looks at a grave. He looks at some dirt and dust and earth, and he raises Jesus from the dead. And so, yeah, we could be like Peter and the apostles, and we could kind of struggle with it and go, you know, that that sounds different. That's not how this normally works. But we can also remind ourselves, but this is how God actually works all the time. This is what God has been doing from the very beginning, breathing life into where there was no life beforehand, digging into the dirt, into the earth, and raising up the living. And the good news for you and I is that this is what God has come to do. This is what Jesus came to do, is to give you and me a life that overflows and that doesn't let us down and doesn't disappoint In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul writes, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. See, our our struggle as human beings in this fallen world is that we're, we're looking for life everywhere. And there's all kinds of things that can interfere with your life, right? There are all kinds of things and relationships and 
and jobs and circumstances that can get in the way of you living the life that you've always wanted to live. Right? That's why you get frustrated. That's why you get angry and sometimes you get disappointed because you're like, no, this was supposed to help, but it's made it worse. Right? I thought if I got this person in my life, I'd be super duper happy. They roll their credits at the end and say they lived happily ever after, and now I can't stand them. What's going on, Lord? Right? There are all kinds of things in this life, whether it's relationships or jobs or circumstances, that can get in the way of us having the life we've always wanted. But here's the greatest enemy that gets in the way of life of all, which is death. We don't want to talk about it. We don't ever want to think about it. We don't want to deal with it. Because it hurts, and it's painful, and it goes against everything that God intended. So here's the reality, though. Whether you are a Christian or you're not a Christian, whether you've believed in Jesus your whole life or you just figured out that he rose from the dead, you're going to die. I know that's a really big bummer, but you probably didn't come to church going, I hope he tells me that. But you're going to die. And the reality is, we all have to deal with that whether it comes today or tomorrow or decades from now. And the only hope that you and I are given for the life that we need is Jesus walking out of his own grave. Because the life that he says, here's what I came to give to you, was it's not just, hey, tomorrow will be better, and if I, if I love Jesus, then everything will work out. But to give you a life that is so abundant and so overflowing, it creates life beyond death. And Martin Luther, when he was defining what faith in Jesus meant, he said that faith is trusting in Jesus, trusting in God so much so that you would stake your life on it a thousand times over. So here's what Christianity, here's what Easter, this whole get together is all about. It's about placing our faith in Jesus and saying, he's the only one who can give me the life I need. He's the only one who can give me the life I need here and now that doesn't disappoint, that doesn't get me bored or frustrated, but he gives me a life that overflows here and now and overflows beyond the grave. Because, as Paul says, the, the last enemy to be defeated is death. You and I can fight, and we can wrestle, and, and you can overcome obstacles. You can learn some strategies, and you can overcome some bad habits. But at the end of the day, we will die. And Jesus is the only one who has walked out of his grave and said, but I conquered it. I'm not the dead. I'm the living. I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. And in Jesus Christ, when you and I place our faith in him, we go, oh, that's what Christianity is about. It's about a God who conquers death and gives life to us. Then you and I stop being the dead and we become the living in Christ. And he gives you a life that overflows and is abundant enough to give you eternal life. See, I don't have some grand argument for you to convince you that Jesus actually walked out of the grave. Like, I, I like, just can't argue that for you. So you might be like the women. And you're showing up, you're like, this is not what I was expecting. Or you might be like Peter and the apostles and go, yeah, <laughs> like, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't make sense. So I've been asked, oh, okay, this is what you believe, right? One time I got caught on an airplane. Now, for those of you who don't know me that well, I don't like talking to people, okay? It just, it's not fun for me. So one of my least favorite things in the whole world is being on an airplane. Because you know what happens on an airplane? Strangers, okay? <laughs> and then everybody's like, hey, so where are you going? And I've just gotten to the point where, Look, I know I should be nicer, and I'm working on it, okay? Don't judge me. 
Like, I don't even answer. I just put headphones on of like, look, I'm in a bubble. <laughs> Leave me alone. But one time I forgot my headphones. And I was angry at the Lord for letting me forget my headphones. Because I was stuck by two people who were not obviously prepared for an airplane flight because they had no books, no phones, no tablets. And it's like, oh, you're here to talk. Oh, no. Now, here's another reason I don't like it so much. What's one of the questions that everybody asks on an airplane? Where are you going? And what do you do for a living? Now, that might be fun for you because you're not a pastor. Now, I'm sitting there, and it's like, look, I, I would totally ignore you for the next three hours if you let me, but you brought this on yourself. And they're like, so what do you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. What does that mean? I tell people about Jesus. And they're like, oh. I'm like, yeah, oh, well, you're on the window aisle seat, so you're stuck, because I don't have to get up. All right? And now we're here. And it has having this conversation and this person didn't believe. They knew some of the story, but they, just, they didn't believe, all right? And so they're like, oh, so you really believe that God created everything? Yeah. And you really believe that we messed it up and everything's falling apart? Yep. I was like, I'm tracking. Are you sure you're not a Christian? Because you're nailing it so far. And they're like, oh, and I suppose you believe that Jesus really was born of the Virgin Mary and is God. Yeah, that's kind of a core core part, but I really believe that. And then you believe that he actually, like a dead person, rose from the dead and is alive now. Yeah, that's what I believe. And that's what faith is. It's going, yeah, I, that's what I believe in. That's what I believe in. I believe that Jesus got out of his grave and he is the living who has conquered death. And that his gift to you, what he wants to give you more than anything else, is abundant life that overflows, that conquers death for you and gives you eternal life. So I know like for some folks, hey, it sounds like an idle tale. But this is what faith comes down to you and I are going to die. So you are putting your faith in something or someone, whether you want to admit it or not, whether it's Jesus or something or someone else. So what Christianity is all about, what Easter is all about, is saying that I believe Jesus was telling the truth, that he came to give life. I believe that Jesus was telling the truth when he walked out of his grave and said, I've conquered death for you. So my hope and prayer for you is that you would make your faith in Christianity and following Jesus what it's really all about, which is the fact that he loves you and he has given you the gift of life that goes beyond death itself and that he is risen from the dead and that he is the living God who gives you life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you have risen from the dead, that you did indeed rise and walk out of your grave. And that because of that reality, that we have been given a life that is abundant and overflowing. You have given to us the gift of life that goes beyond death. We rejoice, Lord, that this is what it's all about, that you love us so much that you entered into our sin and our brokenness and our pain and sorrow so that we may have the gift of eternal life with you. In your name we pray. Amen.